hi everybody uh so glad you made it out today and uh you know glad you're here um i really am thankful for you guys and uh your desire to actually study the bible and you know and get into it uh unfortunately today there are a lot of people who call themselves christians who don't seem to be that interested in Bible study or prayer or anything else. Just, you know, want to go to church and have a little club and whatever. But uh, I'm thankful for people who really are interested in, in studying the word because we need it. We need, we need every bit of information we can get to help others today because there's so much going on in the world. Um, David, do you want to open us up in prayer? Can you, are, are you able to unmute? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Okay. Lord God, we're thank you for this time that we can gather together and, and that you can be in the midst of us no matter where we are and no matter what time zone we're in. And we're thankful that you have this amazing ability to be with all of us. And Lord God, we just thank you that you've helped Sandy to study this lesson and given him wisdom. And Lord, let us help to understand this book of Galatians, which we know in the coming days that people will be even more lawless. And, and they will also try to go, there will be some that will think they'll be doing good and we'll be doing evil and want to actually say they're they're not under law. But Lord God, we just ask that you would help us to understand the days we live in, help to understand this lesson, and then ultimately, Lord God, help us to apply it to our lives so that we might be conformed into the image of your son and be ready for what lies ahead. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, David. Appreciate that. Well, today we're moving on to Galatians 2, verses 1 through 10. If you want to keep up. Uh, Paul, in chapter 2, launches into what happened when he met with the apostles. Now, this is important background information to prove, number one, that he is an apostle commissioned by Jesus Christ himself. That's, by the way, is the criteria of being a true apostle. Number two, that the disciples accepted him as one of their own. And number three, that the false teaching of works was very dangerous, so much so that it almost fooled many of the apostles. Hmm. You know, some Christians do not believe that they can be deceived. Uh-oh. In fact, there's whole... Uh, types of doctrinal uh, standings where people don't think a Christian can ever be deceived. But you know what? That's foolishness because if the apostles were almost de deceived, then we as modern believers, we better take the warning seriously. When the disciples asked Jesus about the end times, what did he say? He said this, Matthew 24, 4, Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. That's what he started with. You know, if Jesus said it, apparently it can happen. Why would he say it? Makes no sense to say it if, it if it's impossible to happen. Unfortunately, when I saw the Brownsville and Toronto blessing and all those things come along, I saw a lot of people who called themselves Christians get deceived. So it can actually happen. You know what? Uh, Jesus spoke that to the disciples and the, or the apostles, as they, as they would later, later be called. So you know what? It applies even more to us. We're living in the end times. So we need to learn from history to not be fooled by both legalists or liberals on either side. Uh, uh, there's some clever people out there and they can deceive you. 
they can mix you up. And you know what? That's what the devil wants. The devil wants more than anything to corrupt our belief system. Because he knows if he can do that, then we're in trouble. You don't want to end up believing in a different Jesus, a different Holy Spirit, a different gospel. But that can happen, unfortunately. Remember that, that Jesus said that in the end times, false prophets would come with not just signs and wonders, but great signs and wonders. Did you know that Satan, did you know that Satan can do great signs and wonders? Now, he can't do as great as signs and wonders as, as the Lord. In fact, he can't do divine signs and wonders at all. But just think about Janice and Jambres in Egypt. They were able to duplicate a few of the plagues that the Lord sent on Egypt. Uh, amazingly so. But when it got a little further down the line, they couldn't do it anymore. There are things that Satan can do and there are things that he can't do. But unfortunately, we've got a whole generation of Christians who have been brainwashed into thinking that signs and wonders are the, the way to really tell if God is doing something. Oh, don't be deceived, folks. Hey, people go, have been going to shamans all through history. Why? Because they don't do anything? <laughs> no, because they actually do do something. And uh, it's not divine healing, but they can do healing. I would say it's paranormal healing. I've written actually a, an article on that subject of different types of healings. And, and to be able to tell if something is a true divine biblical healing. There's some criteria that have to that have to be followed for you to be make that proclamation. But today, unfortunately, people are doing that all the time, and it's not true. It's not from God. And what God calls it is lying signs and wonders. And I like that designation because what's happening is people are attributing something to God that's not from God. So be careful, lest you be deceived. Well, let's start with verse 1. 14 years later, I went up to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and set before them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. But I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders for fear that I was running or had run my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. Oh, that's what they do. They're like double agents. They come in and try to spy out what the freedom is that you have and take it away from you. Well, this is the trip, the trip that Paul took to Jerusalem where he brought the offerings of the churches there. Paul had been preaching the gospel for some 14 years already since his conversion when he finally met with all the apostles. Paul wanted to be sure that the Galatian church recognized that Paul's apostolic authority came from Christ, not from a group of men in Jerusalem. Jesus had given Paul a revelation, part of which no doubt had to do with what Jesus had revealed to Peter. This also showed that men did not call Paul to come to Jerusalem, but God had given him divine instructions apart from the other apostles. And this, of course, was also to establish his apostolic authority in the minds of the Galatian believers. But rather than confront the apostles on the issue of the Gentiles in public, Paul met with some of the leaders in private. Paul's fear was not that he was wrong or that the gospel should not be preached to the Gentiles. They all agreed to, with, with that. But he feared that everything he had been teaching would be undermined by those who had begun to accept the false teachings of some Jews who were uh, saying that the Gentile Christians 
needed to come under the law of Moses in particular, but they needed to be circumcised. Now, Paul Titus went with Paul, likely as a demonstration of the fact that God approved the Gentiles whether or not they were circumcised and Titus was not. God's approval of believers and indwelling of the Holy Spirit does not rest on the law, but on Christ and his finished work on the cross. One thing that false teachers always do, they infiltrate churches to spy on the freedom Christians have, then use that freedom to try to make people slaves to false doctrines. In this case, slaves again to the law from which Christ had freed them. Legalists want to put people in chains, the same chains they wear themselves. Well, they're not content to live their lives to their own standard, but they want to impose it on everyone else who will listen to them. On to verse 5. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. As for those who seem to be important, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not judge by external appearance. These men added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles uh, or the Greek uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the Jews. Um, and uh, that is, they talk about the Greeks, but it's really they're talking about the Gentiles. For God, who was at work in the ministry of Peter as an apostle to the Jews, was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. But Paul recognized the infiltration of false brothers and did not give them any room to deceive others. Paul did this so that the ministry to the Gentiles would not be compromised. The 12 disciples didn't impress Paul. He treated them like anybody else. You know, and this is how we should be also. God is not a respecter of persons. I see this mistake made so many times by people who call themselves Christians. Oh, you know, we're impartial and this and that. But you know what happens? As soon as somebody challenges their pastor on some false doctrine, oh, they come to his defense. Oh, don't do that. Don't talk about that person. He's, he's, a, he's a great teacher. Instead of listening to the uh, rebuke and taking it to heart and checking it out. No, they don't do that anymore. Very few people, especially pastors, take admonishment and rebuke anymore. It just doesn't happen. Well, many times we allow our traditions of honor to help to keep us from telling the truth. But Paul was not about to give up one of the central themes of the gospel for anyone, including the original 12. You know what? We can all be thankful for that. God doesn't judge by the outside, but on the inside motives. And so we should also not be swayed by outward things when the real issues are internal. They're spiritual issues. 1 Samuel 16.7 but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. He's talking about Saul. Fortunately, the apostles recognized that Paul had been given a mission by Christ himself to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. They saw that Jesus had assigned them different places, Paul to the Gentiles and Peter to the Jews. You know what? This shows that we all don't have the same ministries or gifts necessarily. God gives various gifts to various people in various ways. First Peter 4.10, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithful, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. And of course, 1 Corinthians 12, 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. 
This is what makes this whole idea that you have to speak in tongues to show that you have the Holy Spirit not true. Not all have the same gift. You know, God was at work in the ministry of the apostles wherever they were sent. Paul could see that God was at work through the Jews through the ministry of Peter and the others. They, in turn, could see that God was at work through the ministry of Paul to the Gentiles. In verse 9, it says, James, Peter, or Cephas, and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should, we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. You know, the apostles in particular the three who were called the pillars of the church extended fellowship to Paul and Barnabas. Uh, note something uh, that's an error that the Catholics have. If Peter is supposed to be the rock on which the church is built, how do they deal with this verse? <laughs> Where it seems that James, Peter, and John were the pillars for a foundation of the church. Well, the fact is that Peter was actually called the little stone Petros, while Jesus is the rock, Petra. Jesus is elsewhere referred to as the Petra in 1 Peter 2.8. A stone, Jesus, that causes men to stumble, and a rock, Petra, that makes them fall. That's Isaiah 8.14 also. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. 1 Corinthians 10.4 and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock, Petra, was Christ. Oh, I see now why the Lord got so mad at Moses for striking the rock. That was a representation of Jesus Christ himself. Jesus was there in the pillar of fire etc. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, the Messiah was there. So the apostles not only recognized that Jesus had called Paul and that he had already been preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, but they agreed that Paul was in the right place and they were in the right place. The apostles also agreed with Paul's gospel where he taught salvation by Grace alone through faith alone. By the way, it's grace alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. God didn't give us the gift of grace and the gift of faith. He gave us the gift of grace. We are to exercise our faith by placing it in the object of our faith, who is Jesus Christ. He will help build our faith, actually often through things like persecution and trials, but he will build us up in our faith. But Calvinists say that you don't even have to believe to be saved. And God already predestined you, you're all done. That's really against what the Bible teaches. We do have to exercise our will and make a choice. Now, we can't do so unless we've heard the gospel and the Holy Spirit convicts us, opens our eyes to ourselves and to who Jesus is, and we believe, we put our trust in him. But the deal is we have to do that in order to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, that, that word for believe is actually means be believing. It's an active word. You know, the only admonition that they gave him, which had nothing to do with the salvation message, was that Paul would not forget to help the poor, which he was already doing. James one twenty seven says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after the orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. 
Unfortunately, a lot of people uh, try to do the first part, but they forget about the second part of that being polluted by the world. This world is all about pollution. It's so funny how people worry about environmental pollution. <laughs> Spiritual pollution is far worse. And what's happening on TV these days with television ads and movies and video games and all this kind of stuff, computer stuff is horrible. It's absolutely horrific. When I see stuff like that, I just yearn for Christ to come back. I'm so tired of what this world is dishing out. It is brainwashing people. We need to be careful lest we be brainwashed. God does want us to help the poor, particularly widows and their children and orphans. We also need to keep ourselves from being polluted by the world. Mark 14, 7 says, the poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. We need the Lord. And guess what? People need the Lord. Oh, yeah, they may need uh, physical help. They may need material help. And we should do that when we can. But the first order of business is spiritual help. You know, back in the day when my parents went out to be missionaries, that was always the first order of business. Well, we had ways to help people materially, but we are always made sure that we were attempting to help them spiritually by preaching the gospel, etc. That's very important. You can't go out there like Mother Teresa and then tell people, oh, they can go back to their pagan religion. That's not helping. Jesus himself stated that we can and should help the poor. But our first responsibility is to serve and worship him. Luke 4, 18, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. That's what we should be doing, preaching the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to release the oppressed, etc. We should never forget our first responsibility. And what is that? It's called the Great Commission. I was so interested to see that there was a poll done and a very low percentage of Christians even know what the Great Commission is today. <laughs> what is that? I don't know what that is. Is that where we uh, march through the street and march for Jesus? And Put up banners and shout Jesus, Jesus, Jesus in the public square and marching around, taking the land. No, has nothing to do with that. Jesus was sent to preach good news to the poor. That means not only those who are poor materially, but those who are poor spiritually. We need to be first concerned with the poverty of the spirit. And that concern will also bring us to help people with poverty of the flesh. I read something interesting in a publication. It was called God's partiality toward the poor. The phrase God's par uh, preferential option for the poor describes a phenomenon found throughout the Old and New Testaments. God's partiality toward the poor and the disadvantaged. Why would God single out the poor for special attention over any other group? I used to wonder. What makes the poor deserving of God's concern? I received help on this issue from a writer named Monica Helwig, who lists the following advantages of being poor. Number one, the poor know they are in urgent need of redemption. Oh, that's a big one. The spiritual elite, the people who think they're on top of, you know, they're the Pharisees of today, they are almost impossible to reach. But you know what? Often the poor, they know they're sinners. They know they need a savior. Number two, the poor know 
not only their dependence on God and on powerful people, but also their interdependence on one another. Number three, the poor rest their security not on things, but on people. Number four, the poor have no exaggerated sense of their own importance and no exaggerated need of privacy. Number five, the poor expect little from competition and much from cooperation. Number six, the poor can distinguish between necessities and luxuries. Number seven, the poor can wait because they have acquired a kind of dogged patience born of acknowledged dependence. Number eight, the fears of the poor are more realistic and less exaggerated because they already know that one can survive great suffering and want. It's a big one. Number nine, when the poor have the gospel preached to them, it sounds like good news and not like a threat or a scolding. I like that one. Number 10, the poor can respond to the call of the gospel with a certain abandonment an uncomplicated totality because they have so little to lose and are ready for anything. So in summary, though through no choice of their own, they may urgently wish otherwise, poor people find themselves in a posture that benefits the grace of God. In their state of neediness, dependence, and dissatisfaction with life, they may welcome God's free gift of love. As an exercise, I went back over uh, Helwig's list, uh, substituting the word rich for poor and changing each sentence to its opposite. For instance, the rich do not know they are in urgent need of redemption. The rich risk their security not on people, but on things. <laughs> so true. <laughs> Jesus did something uh, similar in Luke's version of the Beatitudes, but that portion gets much less attention. But woe to you who are rich, for you've already received your comfort. See, the Lord does that a lot of times. You'll notice that in the Bible. He'll turn things around. But this is an interesting one. He, uh, this person says, next, I tried something far more threatening. I substituted the word I. Reviewing each of the 10 statements, I asked myself if my own attitudes more resembled those of the poor or of the rich? Do I easily acknowledge my needs? Do I readily depend on God and other people? Where does my security rest? Am I more likely to compete or cooperate? Can I distinguish between necessities and luxuries? Am I patient? Do the Beatitudes sound to me like good news or like a scolding? As I did this exercise, I began to realize why so many saints of the past have voluntarily submitted to the discipline of poverty, dependence, humility, simplicity, cooperation, and a sense of abandon are qualities greatly prized in the spiritual life, but extremely elusive for people who live in comfort. There are many other ways to God, but oh, they are hard, as hard as a camel squeezing through the eye of a needle. In the great reversal of God's kingdom, prosperous saints are very rare. I do not believe the poor to be more virtuous than anyone else, though I found them more compassionate and often more generous, but they're less likely to pretend to be virtuous. They have not the arrogance of the upper class who can skillfully disguise their problems under a facade of self-righteousness. They're more naturally dependent because they have no choice. They must depend on others simply to survive. I now view the Beatitudes not as patronizing slogans, but as profound insights into the mystery of human experience. God's kingdom turns the tables upside down. This is what's so wonderful about Christianity. It turns everything else upside down. That's the most unique religion, if, if, if you would have it that way, in the world. The poor, the hungry, the mourners, the oppressed, truly are blessed. Not because of their miserable states, of course, 
Jesus spent much of his life trying to remedy those miseries. Rather, they are blessed because of an innate advantage they hold over those more comfortable and self-sufficient. People who are rich, successful, and beautiful may well go for, through life relying on their natural gifts. People who lack such natural advantages, hence underqualified for success in the kingdom of this world, just might turn to God in their time of need. Human beings do not readily admit desperation. When they do, the kingdom of heaven draws near. And I, I really like that uh, particular uh, article that I read and thought it uh, went along with what we're looking at today. Mm -hmm.